I'm going to discuss today about the predictors of uh, good and bad outcomes of cross-linking. And probably cross-linking is something which has come into every clinic, every practitioner, uh, from, from a big city to the, the third tire or even beyond that. There are a lot of doubts and dilemmas when you manage uh, a care performance with cross-linking. So I thought that using this model of uh, discussion might be interesting to take it forward. So we all speak about uh, the 5.0 nomogram, that's the title of my talk here. I thought I'll introduce this 5.0 nomogram here, it's also given in the book which we published in our year. The whole the reason we, we uh, decided to publish this is because we found that there was a lot of uh, confusion about managing care performance, like what Dr. Lucy said, you know, should we use a ring, should we do cross-linking, should we do both, multiple things, something else. So always that confusion used to come personally when we were working in our clinics. So we thought we'll make a, a simple algorithm about how we manage a care performance. It looks scary when you look at it once, it did scary even more before we came out to this kind of a simplified version. Uh, so it is a five step procedure and we always go to those five steps because when we go through those five steps, we really don't miss out or unnecessarily treat. My worry is always about treating somebody without a reason because nature heals better than any good doctor. And that's what happens in care reporters. Majority of them, when you look at the demographics, I'll come back to what is high risk. Again, we have a scoring system here about what is high risk for a care performance. The high risk could be a young patient, female, or somebody who's uh, uh, planning to conceive or post-pregnancy, or having an assistant allergy, everything gets a scoring system. Once the scoring system is high, or when the scoring system is low, when the scoring system is low, then you probably don't need to do anything. And what's interesting is, majority of them are not the high scorers, the majority of them are low scorers. That means that they don't need an aggressive management here. So most of them, when they have a low scorers, or when the patient is, they would probably go into the contact lens. But there are patients who would say that, well, I'm not really happy with the contact lens. It keeps falling off. I'm, I'm just getting too much of an issue. And then you look at the corneal thickness, and then you can plan what Dr. Lucy said based on the thickness. However, a good contact with specialists would be able to handle 80 to 83 percent of the case without getting into any form of treatment. Now, the patient is a contactless tolerant, but he is having a progression. What do you do? Then they follow into this pattern of uh, cross-linking, which I'm going to discuss. If the patient is a contact that is intolerant and he's got a good thickness, then probably you do a little bit of a laser. That again is just around 6 to 7 percent of the population what we see. We have a contact that is intolerant, but the thickness is not good. And the patient understands very clearly about the limitations of putting a ring. The, the rings has got a huge limitation. I've been doing rings <coughs> from 2006 onwards, close to 10 years today, and still have not found perfect algorithm, even though I published two algorithms, it's not a perfect algorithm for putting that in. So you have to be extra careful about that. And in advanced cases, you just need a general policy. Basically, you have a scoring system which tells you whether you are at a high risk, low risk, or no risk, and then you based on this, and this is exactly what this algorithm actually means, and that's what is given out there. Now, what are the risk factors which has a scoring system? The risk factor comes in age, the higher of it, the atopic nature of the illusion, and how frequently you change the glasses. And everything has got a score which we are trying to evaluate. And more than eight, if you add, for example, the patient is less than 20 years, he's got a history of eye rubbing which is very significant, and all these other factors, like you can add some pregnancy, or all these factors add up to get it to score. And this score which helps us to go back this and decide whether which area are you in, whether you are a high risk or a low risk. This helps us to find those people who really need a treatment from those who really require nothing. Just probably an observation. So this is something that is what we call it as a 5-point nomogram because 
there are five steps of looking at from the simple observation of the one step to a more advanced lamellar or, or a penetrating keratoplasty. This is what we do in our practice. So my next 20, 25 minutes is more of a question and answer, which, which I keep getting these questions all the time from my own people and also from outside. What is real progression? How do you define a progression? This is always a big dilemma because we really do not, we might be wondering that there is so much of advancement in, in topography science, we still don't know what is a progression. So what we did was we looked at uh, progression indices. We looked at a steep K increase at an area which is a steep out here. For example, this was a steep K. And if you have an increase of a steep K by more than a 0.752, I kept it as 0.5 because most of the machines have a repeatability issue with a 0.5. That means if I take a machine and do three times reading, the range can be between a 0.25 to 0.75. So that means it should probably should be above 0.5, like in this case, a darker, darker half of progression. But is that enough? The question is, just a simple change here means that it might be falling into the repeatability of the machine itself. And if I do a one on a pentacam and this one on an scan, both the values may be different. So it has to be always on your, on your same machine. That's why when a patient comes to me and shows that the scan done, say, in Bombay or Calcutta, I tell them that the machines may be a pentacam. It just does not mean that the repeatability of that machine is the same. There's so many factors play a role, even from the technician to the way the machine is calibrated, the way the machine, the scans are done, everything plays a role. So it's in your own machine, in your own place. That means progression is defined in your own clinic, not two different places. And then you look at the difference and also look at the how much is your refractory error changing. For example, in this case, at least more than a darker or slightly equivalent change in the cylinder also goes to that all defines a progression. <coughs> and then finally, it is your documentary at the same point. And that is again goes to 10 percent change. Somebody said told me that 10 percent is a huge difference. Uh, from the progression point of view. It is a huge difference. The reason is, again, the accumulatory is extremely sensitive for repeatability issues. When we did a repeatability studies, the accumulatory is the one which behaves completely different when you're doing a same machine repeatability. So I kept that 10 percent off just to keep that, that fudge factor to see that we don't miss out anything. So what are the three things which makes a difference? The three things which makes a difference is your steep axis and also look at the, the cluster points in that area. For example, this is 43.1 and you can see the 43.7, 42.0, 43.2. So if you look at not only the steep point here, also the cluster points around the area of steepness and see what is happening. When you have a cluster point, you are very, very sure that this is a progression one. If you have one area of progression, it may just see that the patient fixation may be different and you have picked up a different point when you are doing a repetition. So that means your cluster points helps us to be sure that you are always measuring the right place. And this is something which is very important and then your refraction and your thickness point. I will spend a little time on this because progression is everything and all the time we miss or we lose or more treat because we define progression in a different, completely different way. The second question asked is, how do I decide on the machines for cross-linking and which props do I use and which company makes these props and from where should I purchase this from? It's all given in the book. So there are different types of props, the Vibex, Vibex Rapid, which is not available because we cannot import riboflavin drops because it's not still passed through the drug controller's rule. So most of these drops, I think some of these drops are available but not the Vibex. But the IOK I think is making these drops locally, but the composition is what is given out here. Uh, Medicross uh, again is one which has got an HPMC. Uh, this is something which Theo Seller keeps talking about, how science 
uh, when you do something research and you have a product and how economics takes over more than science. So when they were trying to do this uh, uh, experiment, they used dextran because they wanted the dextran to dehydrate the eye, uh, the pig's eye, because it was very thick. So they said, uh, riboflavin, let's use dextran on the riboflavin because they wanted to dehydrate it because the cornea would be very thick for cross linking. And then what happened was, because they had already made a solution which had an approval for a trial, they went on to the human trial. And human trial got accepted with riboflavin with dextran. And dextran can cause severe dehydration of the cornea and can, you can really make the cornea become less thicker. So now the question came, should we change the experiment? The answer was, well, you know, we have already got an approval, we cannot get it again. It's going to take a lot of time and effort. So let's keep it as it is. So that is the story of the experiment, because the experiment was used, not used for humans. It was more for an animal eye. Now we have people using HPMC. I think HPMC with riboflavin probably is a better form of uh, drops because it does not dehydrate the body in the way that expand does. So that may be one of the reasons. So probably if you when you ask your vendor, you can always ask them to apply a riboflavin drops without expand, probably an HPMC base, or that probably would be a better form in today's world of uh, cross linking. Uh, coming to the machines, I use all of them in my practice. It's some way look a little more beautiful than the others all the same. It's just a UV light, so it doesn't make any difference. Whatever is financially viable for you and whatever you feel is for a good uh, a good understanding with your distributor is what you need to buy. It doesn't make any difference what you use or which machine you use because there's no difference. It's not like a refractory surgery machine where each machine will differ. The third question is what protocol do I use? Because I'm, like, you know, I'm using a 3 million watts for 30 minutes and there are a lot of new, new things which keeps coming. Should I go for it or I stick to the same one? This is a very big question which people keep asking because this is a regular protocol. It's great the epithelium. Use the point one rather than it with or without extra for 3 minutes or 30 minutes. This is a big classic risk-end protocol. This is what was done in Risken and what we always use many, many, many years. Then, because there was a conclusion, we started working on this project and uh, we published this work uh, two years back, uh, last year, about which protocol. To our surprise, the best protocol is still what everybody uses, the 3 million watts for 30 minutes. Because what that results which was given, and still for me, that's a benchmark. But it's an extremely boring procedure. Both for the patient, surgeon, takes up a lot of OT time. Is it possible for us to have more than two or three cases? So we looked at what is the second best. Probably the second best is nine millivolts, if your machine can do. That means that if you have a machine which is doing a three millivolts, and if somebody comes to your clinic right, from a company and says that he or she, why don't we just go for the new one because that's the most modern one, Please remember this paper what we published in AJO, which, teach, which tells us that the best protocol is still what we started with. There's nothing to compare with it. So please don't go by the company gimmicks that faster is better. Faster is not the better one here. Whatever is being done, whatever is being shown, is all done with the old protocol. However, if you have a logistics issue and if you want to change, probably 9 millivolts would be the second best, beyond which it's a big question mark. I don't think we should even look at uh, these uh, things at all. So there are sometimes, you know, machines come out because there's a lot of competition. Somebody come and said that, you know, you need more oxygen because oxygen is more needed for this whole procedure. So when you are doing a procedure, if there is no oxygen, which is pumped, then the cross effect will not be good. There's nothing external to predict to, to do this. However, some machine will say that we have a pulse mode. Uh, I just want to show what is this pulse mode is that the, for when, you are, when the light is on, for every second it stops for one second. That means one second the light is on and it goes off for the second second. So what does it do in this one second off is it allows the person oxygen which is allowed there because the consumption of oxygen happens if you're on, the light is on all the time. 
We believe that the light oxygen consumption is so much that there will be not be enough oxygen to really cross across the ocean. So if a company comes and says that I will, this machine has a new protocol which gives you oxygen, it just means that it's getting on and off, which according to me, nowhere they will be able to do that is for a better form of treatment. So in, in that means you can virtually forget about this at this point of time. So this question keeps coming all the time that how do I make this better? How do I make the outcome better? First, to make the outcome better, we have to find out is there any selection criteria which makes it better? The answer is no. We also published a little bit on gender, which means that females do a little worse than the male because maybe it's hormones, maybe, they, maybe many other factors, maybe the collagen itself is different in male and female, which we don't know. The age group may or may not, but there's really no pre-operative differentiators which will tell you that source of person will get a better, better, better prostate. However, something which you can do is, if a patient is on a contact lens, there's a more information in the eye. So you have to pre-treat the information. For example, if a patient is on a prostate, sorry, on a contact lens, an RGP lens is for three or four years, and you know how the RGP lens fit this patient, they're not the best fit. So probably stopping the contact lens, retreat the information because information, like Dr. Natasha mentioned, drives the whole keratoconus. If you, information is low, the keratoconus is the factor which drives actually gets reduced. So something which you have to look for. And we have been working on a lot of low grade uh, subclinical immune changes. One of them is of the vitamin D. In fact, the first paper of vitamin D and keratoconus was published way before the World War II in American Journal of Ophthalmology. Afterwards, we've forgotten about it. But today, it's an emerging goal. Why is it important? Is because it changes a lot of stuff in your cornea also. These are all in publication in the last one or two years in major journals about how information can be driven by this factors. And most of our patients who develop heteroponus are the ones who are the younger age groups who are indoors and they work on this they, they, are, they are not exposed to sunlight. So this is one factor which you can probably correct before you go into aggressive into cross-linking. One is treat treat them. Many times we, in our LASIK patients, we just tell them that we stop the contact lenses and come back to me. That stopping and come back to me does not really work in here. You probably have to treat treat them because whether it, if it's with a lubricants or a cyclosporin, I would not have to do steroids here because you know we change the the whole balance of immunity, but probably a little more uh, less uh, potent than the steroids would work out here. Keep, where do you keep the riboflavin? Many times the riboflavin, when you come and you get a stock of riboflavin, it's kept in wherever you want, near the windows, sometimes in different places. Again, you have to be kept in a dark place, and when you're doing uh, a procedure, it always they say that it can be in a, in a darker kind of a uh, scenario because again there has been some role of riboflavin being activated by light and unnecessarily it may not I mean, these are small small things but it might help into your practice and this is what I was mentioning about how do you remove an epithelium for me the most important thing more than the machines is I'm worried about how I remove the epithelium if you remove the epithelium in a achromatic way your healing is also going to be achromatic if you are burning the epithelium off, you are scraping it with a blade or you are scraping it with different different techniques, it actually creates more mess. So we studied this uh, particular system of using uh, a company from Israel, which is called the Subformance uh, Caratectomy, which is just a plastic, it's not even a blade, it's just a plastic uh, patented, uh, angulated uh, uh, kind of a blade, which actually removes the epithelium without disturbing departments. It cost me a little bit, this cost around four and a half thousand and can be only used only once, but it's worth because it gives me a smooth surface without disturbing the departments layer. And Dr. Natasha did mention about how important this department's layer because it is what which creates a barrier for the information to go in. This question comes all the time where I'm not getting a demarcation line, so that means that I'm not getting a good cross linking. Because first few studies initially always mention about a beautiful demarcation lines, and if you don't get a demarcation line, it's a failure. 
Are we still believing that or the world has moved on? The market share line is nothing but a zone. It is more of an optical zone actually. It's a zone where there is changes as it's a bit uh, where you, you have the end of the change which is having some kind of a reflection and this is a keratocytes pre operative and this is your demarcation line and this is the area where for that few months you see the collagen actually on a morphocal microscopy because the collagen is swollen up and there is a lot of changes happening in the structure which make the collagen to show up for a few months. So what happens actually is different different protocols will give you different different layers of of, uh, of demarcation line. For example, the best if you want the best demarcation line which we all believe in, the standard crystal protocol because you are having more depth of care. But demarcation line means there is depth of keratocytes until that level. So it is not always means that it's great. That means that if you're doing a standard cross-linking, your depth of keratocytes have gone deeper. These are all the keratocytes here, the white ones, they have gone deeper up to 350 microns. And when you're looking at an accelerated, it's much superficial. Transepithelial probably is the worst because it's extremely superficial out here. And this takes at least six months for it to go. So what preoperative medicines are used? What uh, Preoperatively, you can use, like I mentioned, you can use uh, uh, your, you can, if the quantitation is a contact lens wearer, probably you can use uh, anti inflammatory like a cyclosporin there and some lubricants. Most of, and most important thing is, we would try to avoid uh, bigger mox uh, or any moxifloxacin drops because moxifloxacin preoperatively, if we put it in before the surgery, has comp the riboflavin and moxifloxacin operates with the same wavelength. Wave, wave, the 370 nanometer is the same wavelength which both of them compete. The question always was that when they compete with each other, one will try to block the other. So never use a moxifloxacin or mox or any of those products preoperatively in a cross-linking patient. Steroids for six weeks, I use a milder one. I don't to address, I'm not worrying too much about scar lubrication, and I try to. I believe that it's inflammatory, and I keep them on cyclosporine for six to one years and omega three fatty acids because it helps to reduce any uh, lip based inflammation, which can be a trigger factor for this. Question comes is how do I manage the thin corneas? Over the microns. If you look at the thin corneas, it's always we move around 30, 40 microns from there because the epithelium is going to go off. So this is one of those papers which mentioned that if you have a small bit of epithelium here, you probably will never get a cross linking on there. And this is a contact lens here. This is the epithelium which is removed. And you can get a cross linking epithelium blocks everything. So this paper was published uh, in 2012 and it made a huge impact into the way how trans epithelium cross linking was done earlier, which just do some great pattern with Professor Theosella was to say. And post when I showed these images, everybody stopped doing the grid pattern because we believe that it does not work. So we have to remove the full application, it's all or none at this point of time. Let's look at this factor, less than 400 and more than 400 uh, microns. Uh, trans epithelium, I'm not going into this, it's failed everywhere, it's failed with me, and there's absolutely no role for this because if you do, if you still want to do a trans epithelium, this is the protocol, use two types of drops, one with bag for 90 seconds for 4 minutes and then use the regular isotonic hypoflavin and then use the highest energy what you have. But what really happens is you only cross linking the epithelium, which is of no use. You can see that this is a preoperative and all it is concentrated is on the epithelium. So I don't really see a reason what is really the use of this whole procedure. And because every of all my patients on whom I've done have come back with a uh, Provision. I believe that because, and what is interesting here is which I want to bring it up if I have been working on it, is patients on whom I have done a trans epithelial cross linking have progressed faster than on those who have not done anything for them. The question is, I always wonder why. I think it's because you have created so much of a toxicity of the epithelium here that the con 
model epithelial toxicity has completely messed up with the uh, information because you're using bad, you're using all kinds of stuff just to create an epithelial uh, breakdown of the epithelium and which does not really go. You're not removing that epithelium also. So I've had children coming with say 100 times more faster progression than the children on whom I'm not done. I strongly believe that there is something to do with the toxicity we are creating on the epithelium. So I have personally believe you are creating a more mess by doing a trans epithelium now and completely stopped it for the last few years. This is published by uh, Amara Karamal's group about using the contact lenses on the cornea and uh, measuring the pachymetry and then using it. The most important thing is you, use it. you need to use the contact lenses which is a non-UV blocker and you have to soak the contact lenses in riboflavin so that uh, you don't need to keep putting the drop. This is published by Dr. Kumar Pass, I said I do use the lenticule just to swell up the con thicken the cornea and do the procedures. There are different ways of doing it. So we also probably, <coughs> based on Mesota's group, what we did was the thinnest point of the cornea, we tried not to remove the, uh, uh, the epithelium and this is the most thinnest part. Just measure it from the topography and roughly keep the epithelium on and this is a hand velocity just to prove what is happening at that point of time. And we, you know, just a small area and you could see that because we were all the whole all around epithelium was removed, probably the riboflavin was trying to percolate down and you can see that the depth of riboflavin uh, penetration is not as much as this but it's still there. So what we do is in a very thin cornea is we just try to keep that point of area a small area because that's the only area which we are worried about because the rest of the areas is pretty good. The thinnest point is the one which is always your question. So this is one of the methods what we have done and this is an enhanced view of what really happens out here. A couple of small things which we can do is not using a speculum when you are doing a thin cornea. When you, use a, when you don't use a speculum, make the patient to close his eyes, they put a drop and close his eyes. They, this paper from JCRS mentioned that you have better results in the thinner cornea when you don't put a speculum. So just not putting a speculum in the thin cornea itself has got a role in a better outcome. That's what this says. And sometimes you can reduce this. I got that Edhard Spurl was a co-founder of this whole cross thinking. He mentioned that you can actually reduce the time of irradiation and trying to reduce the time itself can give you a uh, same effect than trying to do a trans epithelial or trying to do an isoosmolar drops. Isoosmolar drops is also an idea where you spell the cornea again. Recent articles, even I saw Professor Sayles uh, talk yesterday, it means that when you use an isoosmolar, hyperosmolar drops, what happens is you are actually swelling the cornea. When you swell the cornea, it's water, and water does not cross it. So you have to be very careful about these things, which gives you more. It gives you more uh, uh, benefit to the surgeon, not to the patient. I feel two things which benefits the surgeon is financially. is your transepithelial cross thinking which does not work. And the second one is hyperosmolar, which just is water there, which just again does not work. And he showed some results about how they were not really functioning as well as the regular one. So contact lens use or trying to keep the island of epithelium may be one of the things which can avoid, avoid these two procedures. And coming to my, uh, this question about, I'm getting different kinds of outcomes. My outcomes vary. I have, I have AIDS, I have scar, I have uh, pain, I have different, different issues. For this to understand, we need to go back and see what really happens in a prospecting at a cellular level. This is epithelium. This is the first week epithelium you have epithelium edema, you can see. And that's why the, you have the corneas which is lazy and there are absolutely no nerve fibers in the first few months after you do cross thing. And then, this is your pre cross thing, this is your keratocytes. We call it as a rare fraction of keratocytes, they're all dying. Because they're all dying and the keratocytes are trying to convert themselves into the myofibroblast. So when you're looking at the keratocytes getting into a myofibroblast, this is the first stage. This is a healing phase when you are actually burning. And in a one-month period, there is more of a 
He is trying to keep an entire water there, and that is what is called more like a honeycomb. So what it means is, it takes close to one year for the keratocytes to repopulate exactly the same way as your preoperative state. So it's important that if you are trying to, there are times people will say that I'm trying to do a recorrection, I'm trying to work on different things. These repopulation takes a year. That means if you're trying to do a second keratro, sometimes I've seen people advising what is progressing, I need to do a re uh, uh, cross linking. Imagine what would happen. It takes so much of time for that to come from zero to complete loss of keratocytes, to complete repopulation. Again, you're going to kill it by the way. So that is something which this thing face. And how do you apply this? Again, your uh, this is a collagen, this is your uh, demarcation line and it takes around six months. Sometimes we do get some kind of haze, you know, some, some non patchy haze, it just doesn't go and you see it on a slip, slip line. They don't look too impressive. These haze are nothing but change in the myofibroblasts of these keratocytes, which are just not gone. They're just not reconverted, they're not laid down new collagen, so that's dark. So, you cannot do anything about it. This will not go with steroids because you, you cannot block it. Whatever. This is not the kind which you'll be worried about. So what you really get is sometimes you have these uh, formats which are broken and you remove the epithelium and when you do that, sometimes you get this patchy kind of uh, uh, scar. And if you do the same on focal microscopy, it's completely different from a scar because it's a completely different type of collagen which is laid out there. Why you get a different type of collagen is we studied this in many of our patients is when you have this kind of a punched out, it's, you need a very, very high definition OCT to figure out what is happening to the, that area is that you have this punched out lesion which is very difficult to see and these lesions, when you, when you do a cross linking, you, you can't see them, you just remove those epithelium off and you can see how the epithelium has just made a well out there and when you do that, the keratocytes here come up and you start re re repopulating there. And the keratocytes in that area will never lay down the, the same collagen as a collagen 4 or 6 at this point. They will lay down a different collagen, maybe collagen 1 or something else. So what happens is, like this, you have a small area like this and you have a repopulated one and you see that this collagen which is laid down here is a completely different from the collagen out here. So what does it cause? It causes this. Or if it's bad, it becomes something like this. Or even if it's bad, it becomes like this stuff. That is a factor why even though you do such a beautiful cross linking, you end up in such bad different different stars, different different cases like this. And always the question asks is, uh, how do you define a failure of cross linking? Like in this case, we have a change, a done a cross linking and post basic case at this point, but it's completely progressing. You have to mention to a patient, there are many people that there is a huge, up to close to 10% of the cross linking can fail. And with this, which we have mentioned in our, in our consent forms also. The collagen fails because cross linking fails, or you have haze, or you have differential response. Because what happens in a structure is completely different. You may have more inflammation, which is still ongoing. That's what I mentioned. You need to treat them. Your collagens may be different in the eye. Some area may have a lot of collagen, so that area may have more cross linking. That's why you have those patchy kind of a picture on the stick line because there's more of a collagen driven here and. Structural collagen maintains the transparency. This is what it shows you. And this has been proven by this uh, methods. And we know that the cross linking enzymes are different in different individuals. That's why some patients, whatever you do, they never get cross linked because the cross linking enzymes are just absent in them. So that is why you have a failure of cross linking. And sometimes the inflammation still is going on in this patient, in what Dr. Natasha showed, which has to be blocked, otherwise the whole cycle keeps going on and on and on again. And that's the rule of uh, cyclosporin, what I mentioned. So what do we do? Can we do a repeat cross-linking? You can, but probably wait for at least two or three years 
before you define it as a failure because keratocytes repopulate close to a year. It takes a year for them to repopulate. And if you're killing them, again it has to go back to zero and start repopulating. So that's one of the challenges for this. So one of the what probability do you use and how do you define a progression? This is one of those very rare papers which looks at more than one factor from the pre-operative value is considered as progression. However, the machines I mentioned do have a repetitive issue. And you can look at all the machines we compared and that Pentacam did pretty well with that. And Cirrus did better with the thickness maps. It was more repeatable on the thickness map. This is a virgin keratoconic corneas which has not undergone any treatment. What happens suddenly is when you have a treatment, which is the haze out here, all the parameters suddenly change because the machines will then start behaving differently because you have haze. How do you know? We are working on these papers about how the haze in post cross linking affects the parameters of a cross linking. For example, this is pre cross linking, there is absolutely no haze. Post cross linking, you can see the haze which is developed, this is in the values, which is there in the pentacam as a densitometry. So you can look at the densitometry changes here. From 0 microns to 300 microns, that we assume is the depth of the cross linking. And you can see that the phase is going to take up to 6 months for it to change. So what does it mean? Is probably defining a progression or a success of your cross linking within the first one year without understanding the case is completely criminal. Because you cannot judge anything because all these machines are driven, they're all backscatters, the light, the haze, the hydration, everything suddenly changes, which creates a completely irrational uh, hyperometry and thickness values. So that is something which we have to look at. So the last few things about uh, pediatric cross-linking, again, it's not about doing cross-linking, it's the same procedure. It's about how you manage a channel after cross-linking is important because the inflammation is still on. And what we try to do is, if it's a mild one, you try to treat with lubricants and an anti-allergic anti one for at least six to eight months and wait for the topo to be stable. In a mild, it's a moderate to severe one, try to pass treat with cyclosporin at least for a year. But children, if you, if you don't break the cycle, it is going to come again and again because it's, it's the whole cycle that we call it an inflammaxis, they will create again the same kind of collagen which you don't want. And in a severe cases, maybe add a petroleum ointment also to the patients. It may look safe, but it's not the safest of procedures. We have published work both on excavated and conventional cross linking do have stem cell problems. We did a review of uh, seven years of uh, patients who referred to us with uh, infections. It does have a chance of infection, so doing bilateral simultaneously, I don't think this is, is cannot be considered at all. And it's maybe rare, but one of the dreaded issues here is most of this which I have seen are, are resistant to much, much common known uh, microbacterials, antimicromacterials which we know of. So for some reason, the same gram positive becomes so virulent for I don't know what, what, what is actually happening here because all of them are just gram positive bacteria but they behave like a very fundament uh, pseudonus. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know, it's a parody that we are using it once to treat infection on one side and it actually actually causes infection, maybe changing the flora is something which is difficult for me to understand. So to sum up on cross-linking, the ideal intensity is still the 3, 3 milliwatts I believe is still the best. If you don't have pancreatic and you always may be 9, the faster is not the better one, it's still, in this case it's being slow, it's still good. Trans epithelial, hardly used and I don't think it's something which we recommend. And uh, other information definitely yes, but we need to keep looking at newer protocols and devices for this. Thank you.